So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue this series today that Pastor Vince opened up last week as we come to the table, and he brought a great word last weekend. If you missed that, go and catch it. Uh, you can always go catch our past services on YouTube uh, and find those there. But I'm excited to continue this today. My name is Aaron. I get to be the location pastor here at the Mountain Home location of Real Life Church. Um, but I'm going to dive in today on, on a pretty common scripture, a pretty common passage uh, that some of you are going to be pretty familiar with. Some of you will be like, well, this is all new to me, and that's great. Um, but I've got a title for you. If you've got notes, you notebook, phone, whatever that works for you, uh, just put it at the top right now. You've got a friend. You've got a friend. How many of you just started singing the Toy Story song in your head? It's <laughs> exactly why I did it, because I knew you'd remember it. You've got a friend. Look to the person to your, to your left or to your right. Pick one of them. Just smile real big. Big cheesy smile and said, you're my friend. <laughs> now pick the one on the other side and say, you're my friend too. <laughs> one of the things that's kind of corny and cliche I like to say uh, when people are here, especially when guests come in to speak or to lead worship or anything like that, is uh, I like to call real life a little bit like Olive Garden, not just because we like to eat, but because we have this heart and this that we're not just friends, we're family. Um, as a team, as a staff, as a church, we're open-handed in all that we do. Uh, so when you walk in through the doors at Real Life Church, you're family, and we want to walk with you and walk for you. Uh, so in, in that day, we're going we're gonna to talk about friendship today. So when I ask you the question of what is a friend, some of you automatically go back to your first friend that you had back in preschool. And then some of you are like my grade school friend or the, the friend I've had since high school. Some of you are like, my best friend is my spouse. And I get the joy and the honor to be able to say that. My best friend is McKaylee Sue Dickinson. And let me just tell you, there's always something fun going on with her. And so I get the joy to be able to say that. And I don't get paid to say that. I just love to say that. And so your best friend, what does that look like? My son Beckham He's four, he's got a song right now that he really likes, and it's called Best Friends, and it's by Hillsong. And it, it really lines up with the culture that we see today. And one of the lines in it is, all of my best friends are sick of pretending. All of my best friends are sick of pretending. That's the kind of world we live in today. There's a lot of pretend. I mean, we, we do it, it's almost by nature now and how we filter things and how we look at our friendships. How many of you have had a friend that you were really close to at one point in time and you're like, I need to check in on them. And about the time you decided that you were gonna check in on them, it popped up on Facebook and they made a beautiful post of their great family or they just went on a great trip and all that. And you're like, okay, good, they're good to go. I, I don't really have to check on them now. I'm glad to see that they're doing well. Our filter is so skewed and weird now. There is a guy that said this one time. Um, his name's Euripides and lived a long, 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 long time ago. Long, long time ago. He wrote tragedy plays and stuff like that back in ancient Greece. And he said this one time. He said, real friendship is shown in times of trouble. Prosperity is full of friends. Real friendship is found in times of trouble. Prosperity is full of of friends. I said kind of a bitey statement in our, in our rally this morning before the 8.30, um, around 7.45, 7.50 every morning, our, our first teams that get here or our teams that are going to be here all morning get together for just a quick deposit and a, and a prayer and a song, and, and we split. And this morning I was talking about something, and I said, how many of you have friends? Everyone raised their hand. I said, good, because if you said you did it, you might need to take a look in the mirror. Um, Friendship is such an important part of our life, and we desire friends, but are we being the right kind of friend that we desire to have? How do we treat people? What does that look like? And we're going to walk through a text today that's probably the most common when it comes to what friendship looks like, or being a, a good, a great friend, a, a loyal friend, not just consistent. And it starts in, in Luke chapter 5, and I'm, so I'm going to read a few verses and then I'm going to pray, and then we're going to dive into the points today. So I need you, I'm going to roll quick. Um, this isn't just like, hey, here's your scripture, here's three points, let's get out of here today. No, there's plenty of scripture, and there's five points. So let's get with it. 
Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It says, On one of those days as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But they found no way to bring him in because of the crowd. And so they went up on the roof and then let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. I want to pray um, over this word and, and what God has in store for us today. So if anybody hasn't closed your eyes, I just want to ask a quick question. Because the invitation on the back end is going to look a little bit different today. Um, nobody looking around, I just want to ask you this. Are you feeling lonely? Are you feeling like you don't have anybody in your corner? Are you feeling depressed or anxious about something? Or, or maybe there's just something just so insurmountable that you feel like you're by yourself. With nobody looking in the room today, I want you to just put your hand up and put it right back down. You feel like you're by yourself, all right? I got you, I got you, I got you. Hands up all over the place. I'm going to pray for you in just a second, but I want you to know it's a lie. You are not alone. There are people ready to walk with you. There is a God that is for you. So be intentional about finding the right kind of relationships. So today, Father, I thank you. God, I thank you for the boldness of the people that just raised their hand and say, I, I just feel like I'm alone right now. God, I pray right now that you would overwhelm them with a sense of your presence that you would let them know that you are right there with them with whatever the trial it is they're walking through, God, whatever the trauma they've experienced or the transition season they're in, God, that right now they would know that the God of heaven and earth, the Lord of all, the creator of heaven, the King of kings and the Lord of lords is walking with them. God, that they would know that people in this room are, are for them and they want to walk with them and, and have a, a, an authentic and real relationship with them. God, I pray right now that connections would be made and opportunities would be taken. God, I pray right now for the word that we're about to dive into. God, that it would be relevant and, and, and active in our lives in this moment. God, that we would remove ourselves out of the way so that your word would be spoken, your will would be done across the room today. God, I thank you for how it's going to change the trajectory and the path of some of the people in this room. God, I thank you that we get to be here. I thank you for our church. God, I thank you for the fact that we get to celebrate life change like we did in the 8.30 this morning through baptism. And for anybody that's ready to take that step, God, that they know that we're available for that. God, I thank you, and I praise you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Five things that these dudes did. There's actually quite a few stories uh, in, in Scripture that relate to good friends. There's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's Jonathan and David. And then well, there's several. And Jesus and the disciples. And, and the Jesus and the disciple ones is kind of fun sometimes. That looks more like what our relationships look like, where it's like a lot of butting heads. Like, hey, you just don't get it. You're dumb. Like, listen to me. Like, so there's a lot of that. Like, there's, when I say there's like all kinds of depictions of friendships in the Bible, study the Bible. There's all kinds of things you could take from it because it's relevant to, to today. So the first thing I want to look at with this group of guys is they've had this friend that he's paralyzed. It's such a, a significant disease, significant illness, that from the neck down, he cannot move. He just lays there. So which means that if he's going to live, that somebody else has to assist him at all parts of life. In all parts of life, because he has no ability to do anything else. He's stuck. There's, there's not medical advancements to be able to say, hey, this is the cure, this is the direction, this is what's going to take place to be able to get you in, in, in walking towards something to be able to walk or to move your arms or your limbs. That doesn't exist. He's just there, unable to move. There was a, a psychiatrist in, back in the 40s. Uh, his name was Victor Frankl. Victor Frankl. And Victor spent time in a concentration camp and he noticed some trends that would take place with people in the camp. There were several that, when there came a moment that it was evident to them, evident to them that ultimately they were going to die at some point in the future, they would just quit. 
they would just zone out, tune out, and just nothing else mattered in the moment. They would just lay on their bunks and be done. No matter how many times a guard came over and screamed at them or knocked them or hit them or how many times a friend encouraged them to get up or to get something to eat. When they got to this moment in their head that this is it, this is all, then they would self-destruct. And a lot of us find ourselves in that kind of spot in life. We find ourselves in places like, I I don't know what's next. I don't know where to go. I've made all these mistakes. I don't know what's going to happen now. I I don't know where to go. So ultimately now, the inevitable is just going to be death. And so I might as well just take it upon myself. And that's not God's desire for any of us. Because the parallel in this is that, yes, they're going to experience a physical death, just like this gentleman with his ailment at some point is going to experience a physical death. Every single one of us are born into something that's going to bring death upon us at some point, but it's a spiritual death. All of us are born into an ugly, tainted, skewed, disgusting thing called sin. See, these gentlemen, they're going to die a physical death that all their pain, everything ends then. But when it comes to sin and a spiritual death, it's still going to continue from the moment after you physically die. A spiritual death doesn't mean it's over now. It just means the physical is gone, and now the actual trauma, the actual hurt is about to really set in. And so we look at this, and it says um, the first thing is to recognize a desperate need. Recognize a desperate need. How many people do you think walked past this gentleman as he laid on his mat with disregard or irregard to the fact that he needed assistance? If four men became his friend to sit beside him and be able to walk with him and encourage him and take care of him, how many people walked past him in those moments, knowing that he had a physical ailment, knowing that ultimately the the end goal was going to be that he was going to die. How many people just walked past him? How many people that we know were fighting a spiritual disease that we just walked past every single day? Well, somebody, somebody else can handle it. I don't have time. Someone else can be responsible for it. Somebody else has a better, a better ability or better training Somebody else has more finances. Somebody else has that kind of heart, that kind of character. Uh, Somebody else is going to do it. It says this in Romans 5, 2, or 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all have sinned. There's not an exception in that. Every single one of us have sin, will sin, experience sin, because it's the tainted thing that we are born into. Because one person made a mistake, all of humanity now pays for it. But even though all humanity pays for it, the great creator makes a way to get out of it. And we're going to talk about that here in just a little bit. It says this in Ephesians 2.12. It says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So the difference here is that this man has a physical illness that will end the moment that he dies. But yet we face every single day a spiritual illness that doesn't go away when we die. Unless we respond to the ability and availability of Jesus Christ. So these guys, they, they see in this moment that somebody has a desperate need. So they recognize the desperate need, so they become friends with this guy, right? Everybody needs friends. It's one of the things that we say here at Life Church is that we are better together. That's why life groups exist. That's why serve opportunities exist. That's why you're sitting in the seat you're sitting today. One of my favorite things I love to tell people, and I love to squash this, because some of you are going to be like, oh, he just got me. He saw me. One of my favorite things is that when people say, how do you even connect with people at real life? It's such a big church. I kind of chuckle because I'm like, it's not really that big in the grand scheme of things. It may be big for the area, but Pastor Vince says it like this. Our church, the size it is, is pretty much just like batting cleanup on a beer league softball team. That's all we are. 
We've done great things and God's been faithful, but there is so much more that's possible. So people are like, how do you connect with people? And I say this, what service time do you come to? Oh, we usually come to the 10 o'clock. Okay. What time do you usually get there? Uh, usually about two minutes late. Okay, uh, we're going to have to adjust that a little bit. So if you got there a couple minutes early, what row do you usually sit in? Uh, we usually sit in the middle section, about two-thirds through the way through the back. Okay, cool. You have a pattern and a habit. And that's what we all try to do. And so if we're going to try and sit in the same row every single time, the people around us are probably going to be trying to sit in the same row as well. So why doesn't somebody just say, hey, I've noticed you've been sitting there for about three weeks. So have I. My name is Aaron. I'd love to be able to connect with you. Now, thanks for being here. Uh, how long have you guys been coming? Just a simple connection. See, we long for connection. We long for friendship, but we don't want to take the steps of boldness to be able to see what authenticity really looks like in a relationship, in a friendship. Because we want everything to be surface level now. Maybe we don't desire it to be. We've been taught for it to be because that's what culture says is relationships are just going to be surface level. And we miss the intimacies and the intricacies of what real friendship looks like. When for someone to be able to look and say, I recognize that there is a need and I'm going to be there for them and walk with them through that. It says in Matthew 10, 28, it says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is going to come together here in a little bit when you see the both and. So they recognize that there is a great need for someone. So they put themselves to the side and they become friends with this gentleman who needs assistance and needs care every single day. I'm sure they come up with some kind of rotation. So it's just not all four of them all kind of day because that, that wouldn't make a lot of sense, would it? They're like, we're all here. We're like, okay, let's go. No, they probably have a system. So they come through and someone can go to work and do other things like that. But they're all still there for him. They recognize the desperate need. The next thing they do is that they realize the cure. They realize the cure. So they know that he has an ailment that's going to keep him from living. They have, he has an ailment that keeps him from seeing physical life to the fullest. But of course they desire for him to experience what it would be like to walk and to go and do things and to go to the store and to be able to cook a meal or to be able to eat on your own, to do life without assistance. They know that they desire for this for their friends. So they are waiting for an opportunity to be able to walk for or see and notice or take advantage of a cure. They recognize this. It says in verse 15, if you back up just a little bit, it says, but even now more the report about him went abroad. It's talking about Jesus. And great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he withdrew, would withdraw to desolate places and pray. Think about this for a moment. Jesus is preaching to the thousands and thousands, but in between he withdraws to a small town, a desolate place, a place that there's not a lot going on so that he can take time to be still and to pray. How many times do we go from the mountaintop and just try to jump to the next mountaintop without taking intentional time in the middle and somewhere quiet to say, God, what are you showing me? What did you just show me? What do you have for me next? And being intentional with that. If Jesus is doing that, you need to take time to rest. And then it says in verse 17, but on those days, one of those days as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of of the Lord was with him to heal. So they hear, they know that this guy is coming. He's been casting out demons. He's been healing the sick. He's been doing miracles and wonders. He's on his way here. So there is a cure coming. We don't know what he does. We don't know what the magic water he brings. We don't know what he speaks. All we know is that he is coming here. So there's going to be an opportunity that they can take that they can get their friend to, to experience healing. The word is going around, the, the, around and around and around, so they know at some point he's going to show up, but he removes himself to a desolate place, so he's in a smaller area now. What would this look like in our own lives? So, cancer is such a, an ugly, devastating disease. And if I asked you if you had the cure for cancer, 
I would hope and I would pray, what, if I said, what would you do with it? You would be like, well, I want to share that because I want people to experience what it feels like to be healed. Some of you just went all conspiracy theory on it, like, there's a cure for cancer out there. I know there is. There's not enough money. There's too much money in it. So here's the deal, though. If you had the cure to cancer and you would just say, hey, I'm going to put it out there for everybody. I want that to be available. What if we looked at it like this? You have a friend that just walked in. They just found out they have cancer. But the doctor tells you that there is a new way for it to be healed and to be cured. And the way for that is for someone else to come alongside them and for them to remove the cells and the cancer within their body, but it still has to have a host, so now they have to place it within somebody else. So for you to experience healing in your friend's life, they want you to walk in and take the cancer out of their life and put it in your own. So now that shift has been that they're going to die, but you're going to die, but they're going to live. How many of us would walk in that? Again, that's a, that's a physical illness. When we look at the spiritual side of it, this is what Jesus did for us. You see, he, he didn't just walk out and say, hey, everybody be healed of sin. Godspeed, everything's good now. Go and do you and do whatever you need to do. No, no, no. He walked in and he said, they're hurting. They're distracted. They make bad choices. They do dumb stuff. They hurt people. They say dumb things. They're depressed. They're anxious. They're insecure. They got doubts. All these things. And Jesus says, they're carrying all that, but I'm going to place it all upon me because this all leads to death, but I'm going to place it all upon me, and I'm going to die in their place so that their spiritual illness will then be healed. That's what Jesus does for us. It says this in Mark chapter 2, verse 17. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came to call, not to call the righteous, but sinners. So in this moment, they're saying, we have heard something's happening. We have heard that, that, that great things are happening across the area. We have to get our friend to this opportunity. If you, if you look at, at our world today, there are people hearing all the time about good things that are happening. Yay, good things are happening. That's about the response we get. But how many of us are taking an initiative when we know that there's something good happening or we know that there's healing taking place or we know that there's a place for restoration and life change to transpire through God and God alone, but yet we just still say, somebody else will get them there. But God is placing specific people in your way so that you can experience the miracle with them. So in this moment, they, they recognize that there's a desperate need. They recognize that there's a desperate need. Then they see that there's an opportunity for, for a cure. They realize that there's a cure. And then they're available to the opportunity. So they recognize that there's an opportunity for their friend to be healed. They know that Jesus is coming. They've heard the great things that he's doing. And it's not just this grand idea of, oh, I wish we could get there. No, they make it a point that they're going to get there. They're available to their friend for this opportunity for them. So in, in this, it says in, in verse 18, it says, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. Key word in there, they were seeking. So they were looking for the opportunity. They were listening. They were watching. They were aware of their surroundings. So not that the healing would take place or something supernatural would take place in their lives, but that it would happen in their friend's life. So they were seeking for this so that they could bring it to the feet of Jesus to be available for this. I think this is such an essential part of what's taking place here. How many of us are available for a miracle to happen in somebody else's life? How many of us are ready to walk with somebody to get them to the moment? Or do we just say, I'll resource you, I'll equip you, we'll get you there, but I got other stuff in my life to worry about. This is the difference in consistency and loyalty that we talked about a few weeks ago. 
If you, if you weren't here, it was just this. You've had a lot of friends in your life and a lot of people in your life that you have probably would have mislabeled as loyal, when more so they were actually just consistent. Well, what do you mean? What's the difference? Consistent means that they were there. They were around. But loyal means that they stuck around through the trial, the trauma, or the transition. That they continue to be by your side. That just because some circumstances shifted, that, 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 that didn't put the friendship on the back shelf. Easy example is high school graduation. You had friends that you were friends with for days and days and days and years and years and years because you were around each other every single day. So you were friends, but you go a year withdrawn from each other. There's not really anything there anymore. They were consistent, but they weren't loyal. See, Judas was a friend of Jesus that was consistent. He was around him for over a thousand days. He watched him do the miracles. He watched the healings take place. He was probably in the room when this happened. He watched all these things, and he was consistent to him, but he was never loyal to him. And that's what a lot of our friendships look like right now. Some of that, that's what our relationship with Jesus looks like, is I'm, I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to show up to church, but, God, I don't know if you're going to, I'm not going to let you do anything in my life. You know, I got, I got, I got an hour and 10 minutes on Sunday morning that, that you can have, and I'm going to be consistent in that. But to take the other steps to be loyal in that, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know if I'm there yet. But these guys, they were loyal to their friend. One of my, my favorite stories about this, and being available to the opportunity, is, a, is another story of a group of people that were sick. And there's the lepers outside the city gates. Second Kings is where you can find this. And there's these guys, and, and they had this illness, and of course leprosy was a significant thing in, in these times. And in these moments, they had to cry out when someone was walking by, unclean, unclean, you had to walk around them. They had to shame and guilt themselves so that somebody else knew that they were around so that they wouldn't be impaired. But there was a group outside of this city gate and they got to this moment where they just had this spark of realization that there's, we've got we've to take a step. We've got to do something. Because we're facing two different options here, which really end up the same. One is there's an enemy grounds just a little bit away. We can go and we can try and go into that territory and see what we can find or what we can come out with. And if they kill us, so be it. But if we stay right here, if we stay here, we die. Either way, this is one thing that the church has done. And I promise you, let me tell you this right now, if we stay here, we die. We have to go into enemy ground to be able to go and take new ground sometimes. We have to be able to go in to say, I'm going to take back the ground that which God has set aside for me. I'm going to go back and take it. When it comes to culture, when it comes to creativity, when it comes to service, when it comes to people, we have to go take back what God has already given us and somebody else we let steal from us. They didn't even steal it. We just gave it to them. I told this to Gainesville last week. Christians have gotten really good at fighting. We've gotten really good at fighting. And we've got to the point where we just fight because that's what we do is we fight, right? Second Timothy, it says to fight the good fight. Emphasis, fight the good fight. We don't just fight to fight. There is a purpose to why we fight. We've gotten really good at fighting people. But that's not what we do. It's not what we're called to do. It's not who we are. We don't just fight people. We don't fight through people. No, no, no. We fight for people. We fight for people because God has created every single individual. He's called them, he's created them, he's marked them, he's named them, he's designed them for a specific purpose before the grand scheme of heaven. And in that, we fight for people because they're going through so much stuff that they don't even know where to go because some of us need to recognize that we need to be available for the opportunity. So these guys, they, they're sitting outside and they're like, 
if we stay here, we die. If we stay here, we die. We got to go try something at least. So they, they make their way out and they start heading out for, for the enemy ground. And when they get to the city, when they get there, it's empty. Everyone's gone. And they walk in. And so they start to eat and they start to drink and there's gold and there's clothes and there's riches. There's all kinds of stuff there because you know what happened? They took a step of boldness and faith. And what God did was he sent sounds ahead of them that scared the enemy away. It was sounds of, of horses and of an army ahead of them. So when they walked in, God was blessing them because of their obedience. But when they sat there, they just didn't take it all in. They didn't just say, okay, great, we got all this. They had this moment where they said, we got to go and tell somebody. <laughs> Keep in mind, they're lepers. They're not supposed to talk or tell anything, do anything. We got to tell somebody what just happened. So they go back and they go and tell so that other people can have the experience. How many times do we find out that Jesus has changed our life? We let Jesus change our life. He's changed our circumstances. He's changed the things around us. He's changed the trajectory of our life. From now, the old is gone. The, dead, the new is here. I'm alive in Christ Jesus. But yet, we don't go tell anybody. That's why this is so significant. It doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything. But it lets everybody else know that I am in this for real that I am here for you, and I hope and pray that you are here for me. They were available to the opportunity because they were seeking for the moment that they can come and they could bring him and lay him at the feet of Jesus. So they recognize there's a desperate need. They realize that there's a cure. They were available to the opportunity, and fourth this, they overcome the obstacles. They overcome the obstacles. It says this in in verse 19. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. This is where the story gets really good if you don't know it. So in this moment, they didn't just get their friend close to Jesus or in the area of Jesus. They put him right in front of him. When you look at the, the, the woman with the issue of blood who, who makes her way through the crowd just so she can touch Jesus, because if she believes that if she can just touch him, that she will be healed. It wasn't just that she was in the area. I'm going to get to Jesus. They said, no, we're going to get him right in front of this guy that can heal him. Not just in the air, because, but here's what could happen. Jesus, all-knowing, all-powerful, they could have walked up, seen the great big crowd around this house, and said, okay, we'll wait our turn. And then Jesus, being all-knowing, say, hold on, I, I know someone is here, and make his way through the crowd, and then get out to him. He could do that. But no, they went the extra step. It cracks me up sometimes about uh, different things that happen in the way they do. Some of y'all went to the Garth Brooks concert a little while back up in Ridgedale at Big Cedar. And some of you had a great time and some of you threw an absolute fit because of getting into it. And I'm sorry, and I'm just gonna say, I'm sorry. If you know there's gonna be like 50,000 people somewhere, get there plenty early, like hours upon hours upon hours early. Just get there. Make your way, but see, that's what happened. They didn't prepare for the moment. They didn't really recognize, like they knew the opportunity was going to be there, but they didn't realize that there was going to be a crowd there. But the crowd didn't stop them. They overcame the obstacles. And not just in this moment, how many obstacles had they overcame years prior? And being a friend to a man that was paralyzed, that's not something that just happened then, every single day, they had to make a decision to go out of their way to help him, to, to get him where he needed to go, to take care of him, to make sure he had the things that he needed. These things are obstacles in their own life to make sure that they were walking with him. And then to get him to Jesus, they had to pick him up and they had to carry him. And then when they get there, they carried him and they can't get inside. So if you can't walk through, 
you go in through the top, and it wasn't some like retractable roof like we have in stadiums now, where it's like, and then they could drop him in. No, they had to pound and dig and pound and dig at the top of the building so that they could lower him through. And can you think about the dude that owned the house? Like, first off, this homeboy in here is just yelling and preaching at people in the middle of my living room. Don't know who he is, don't know where he came from. But then now people are actually tearing my roof off. Who's gonna pay for this? And they drop him through right in front of Jesus. And this right now is where, if you don't know this story, it gets really, really cool because now Jesus is in the middle of it. And it says this in, in, in verse 20 of Luke chapter five. It says, and when he saw their faith, he said, man, your sons are forgiven. But then the scribes and the Pharisees began to question him and they said, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them. He said, why do you question this in your hearts? Which is easier? Is it to say that your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? It's interesting. He's looking at them who have power to do neither to forgive sins or to heal. And he asks them and he says kind of sarcastically, okay, you tell me. Which one is easier to do? To tell somebody that their sins are forgiven or to tell them, hey, get up and walk? Oh, you don't know? Okay, let me do my thing. That's what Jesus does here. Verse 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise up, pick up your bed, and go home. And then immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. And an amazement seized them all. And they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, this last verse here, catch this. We have seen extraordinary things today. By their faith, their friend was healed. First, he was healed spiritually because that's what Jesus cares about is your spiritual illness first. And then once that was accomplished and taken care of, he looks at him, he says, I'm gonna bless you and I know what you came here for. You just didn't know what you came here for. And so I'm gonna heal you for eternity. But now in this moment, since your friends have had such great faith, They've overcame the obstacles and they put you right here in front of me. I'm going to heal you of your sins. I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to set your, your future to be different. But also from that, get up and walk. Get up and walk. Your future eternity is different. You're now a child of God, but also in that, because you're a child of God, get up and walk. Go home. And then everybody else, they rejoice. They rejoice in that moment because in that moment, we have seen extraordinary things. Break down that word extraordinary, extraordinary. It wasn't just the same thing we came in and did last Sunday. It wasn't just the same thing we did when we came to the house last time. It wasn't just the same thing, same time we sang that song. It wasn't just the same word of God that we preached from today. No, something extra upon the ordinary happened. What if somebody's miracle hinges upon you being the one to overcome the obstacles? What if it hinges on, on you being the one that recognizes there's a need? What if it hinges on the fact that you notice that there is a cure, that you are available to the opportunity? Because here's the deal. We live in a broken and confused and hurting world that does not know. They don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what healing looks like. They don't know what life change is. We get so frustrated at people that aren't Christians so often because we're like, why would you do that? Why would you say that? Why would you live that? Because we are in a sickness. We are born with a sickness, a spiritual illness that we don't know any different until Jesus shows up on the scene and changes that. So are you going to be somebody that's available to that? Are you gonna be a friend that's gonna be loyal to the moments and walk with them through the moment that I, I recognized that they had a need? And I didn't just recognize that they had a need and gave them a little pattern, no, they were a friend. So because that they are my friend, a love, a phileo, because they are a friend, a brotherly love, I recognize the need that's there. I'm gonna seek and I'm gonna listen, and I'm gonna watch for an opportunity for a cure. 
And when I find what that cure is, when I hear about it, when I see it, then I'm gonna be available to walk with them to the opportunity. And when we know the opportunity is there, we're not just gonna settle for being in the area of Jesus. No, we're gonna go right up to Jesus because I did all that I can do and now I believe that he's gonna do everything that he can and will do. So I'm gonna get to this moment, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna overcome the obstacles because we have to do it together. And when I see that their life has been changed, that Jesus rescues them and restores them and heals them, the old is gone and the new is here, that they are alive in Christ Jesus, when that, then we rejoice. Then we celebrate together because we watch a moment where they, they sit in a tank like this. That's just water, it's warm, it feels good right now, I promise. It's just water. But if Jesus himself stepped down into the water, if he stepped down and he said, I'm gonna be baptized, I'm gonna show everybody right now that my ministry starts now, that I am doing this for real, that I am answering the call that God placed on my life. If Jesus did that, and then when God looked down and said, this is my son whom I am well pleased. If Jesus did something so significant, then we should follow up. One of the baptisms that took place just a little bit ago was a guy that's been serving here for a while. He got saved a long time ago. His family is plugged into church. They're full of pastors and, and they're like, you know what? Two weeks ago, he's like, I'm tired of faking it. I'm tired of faking it. I know that Jesus has saved me. And I know that my eternity is secure, but I want everybody else to know that I'm doing this for real. And you know who judged him on that? not one. You know why? Because the old is gone, the new is here. Extraordinary things are happening today. What is the extraordinary thing that's gonna happen in your life or the lives around you? You may be feeling like, I, I don't have anybody to walk with me through these moments. I feel like I'm alone. Some of you raised your hand just a minute ago. I just feel like I'm alone. Some of these things that we face are so overwhelming and that all I see is the end. And so maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, I'm just gonna make it the end. You are more valuable than you could ever imagine. God has greater things in store for you. Don't let the enemy put a lie in your head that you are alone, take you away from your future and your potentials that God has in store for you. So that every head bowed and every eye closed in the room today, I want to I close this out with this.